Hi there, I'm JP. Welcome in to Beyond the Briefing. This is our uh, weekly update where we're talking about weather and how to get into the, the deep dive when it comes to aviation meteorology. And uh, this particular episode, I started thinking the other day, I was working with one of my private students and uh, he was getting ready for the private pilot check ride. We were talking about weather and, of course, all the stuff that you do. Uh, we, go in, we were going over uh, METARs and how to decode METARs and TAFs and all that information. And uh, also looking at weather maps. Uh, the weather map, I've worked in meteorology for 25 years. And I assume everybody knows the weather map. But that's not a good assumption. Most people don't know every little nuance of the weather map. In fact, you don't even see the weather maps uh, like we used to see on TV that often. Remember back on TV when you'd watch and you would see the cold fronts and the warm fronts and the highs and the lows? We don't do that as often as we used to because I, I think people just don't get that or they don't want to look at that. They would rather just know, is it going to be 75 and sunny tomorrow, cloudy, rainy, whatever. So in aviation, of course, we still get into the weather maps, or at least we should. So I want to show you some things here. I've got four flight up. This is kind of my go-to electronic flight bag. You may use Garmin Pilot or, or uh, some of the others. They're all great. I enjoy these. You know, the iPad and these tablets, really one of the greatest uh, innovations in aviation ever. All of this at the, uh, really at our fingertips, on the ground, in our flight planning, and also in the air. Let's take a look at a surface analysis. Surface analysis is what is happening right now. So this particular map here, and we're, we're on the images tab of ForeFlight, and we get into the weather section, and this just shows us where the ISO bars are, where the cold fronts and the warm fronts. ISO bars, ISO meaning uh, equal bars pressure, areas of equal pressure. So isobars are, are really the pressure areas where you see these isobars that are really tightly packed together. That's where you're going to have the windier conditions. High pressure, that is great weather. That's beautiful weather. That is that sinking air, and it makes it real tough for clouds to form. Low pressure associated with stormy weather. You can think of it, tornadoes are low pressure, hurricanes are low pressure. These big mid-latitude cyclones are low pressure. So that's our surface analysis. That's what's happening right now. And then we go out into what we call these prog charts. Prog means prognostication. It's, it's a forecast. A human meteorologist has actually drawn this thing out. The meteorologist working for NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Let's go out to a prog that's 48 hours out. And it's showing, and I'll just go full screen here, it's showing a lot of green across the southeast. That means a chance for rain. And if you look into the Midwest, the Plain States, not a lot of rain. Cold front back across Montana and uh, Wyoming. We have low pressure just off the, uh, the coast there of uh, not New England, but the uh, Mid-Atlantic. You can see a little area of low pressure. So that's what's happening into the future. And I'm looking at this prog chart here, and you've got the, uh, the legend out there showing rain, rain likely, snow, whatever kind of uh, precipitation. Uh, this one is valid for 12Z on Saturday, uh, July 25th. So this is looking forward in time. I actually look at these charts. When I'm going on a trip a couple of days in advance, I'll start looking at ForeFlight, looking at some of these charts. These charts are available on the internet. They're on aviation weather sites. Uh, I've been using charts like this for ages in meteorology. We'd actually use charts just like this to draw those old style forecast maps that you would see on TV. Something else we look at, we're always looking for stormy weather. Where's going to be the, where's the stormiest weather going to be? Let's go over here to the left-hand tab and convective outlooks. Uh, convective outlooks. This shows where we're going to have the worst weather, where the forecasters from the Storm Prediction Center out in Norman, Oklahoma are looking at the, the greatest potential for thunderstorms, severe weather, hail, tornadoes, high winds. This goes out three days. So we start with, there's our day one outlook. And again, I'm going to go back to full screen. And really not a lot of bad weather across the country. This category that we're looking at right now, that light green, that's just kind of a general risk of thunderstorms. 
there's a lot of categories here, and these things, admittedly, are very confusing. There used to be three categories, not anymore. Now we have marginal, slight, enhanced, moderate, and high. Very confusing, because folks get confused like, is slight worse than marginal? What is enhanced? What's moderate? Let me tell you, slight is actually a very active weather day. Uh, you get a lot of severe weather with a slight risk. Marginal is kind of your, your typical uh, thunderstorm day with slight. I've been on TV for hours on end on a slight risk day. Um, enhanced is really busy, and then you start getting into moderate and high, and that ends up being some of your big time severe weather outbreaks. So again, as we look at day two here, slight risk for severe weather across the Plain States. And you can even tab over and we can look at what kind of severe weather is that going to be on day two. Well, there you go. 15% uh, probability there of some higher winds across the Dakotas. So that's what we're looking at. 5% uh, chance in that lighter kind of brown area. So you can look at that and determine what kind of weather, or what kind of threats that we're going to be dealing with. That's what we call the convective outlooks, and they go out three days issued by Storm Prediction Center meteorologist out in Norman, Oklahoma. You start getting into moderate and higher risk, those are the, the severe weather outbreaks. Even the enhanced risk uh, days are severe weather outbreaks. You got a number of uh, graphics, for example, there's a SIGMET, uh, SIGMET for, uh, this is convective SIGMETs. We'll zoom in a little bit, look at Florida. Uh, convective SIGMET for Florida there, some bad mojo in that area. A lot of thunderstorms there that you would not want to fly in. And it looks like we're seeing some thunderstorm tops there upwards of 45,000 feet. So the convective SIGMETs are a big deal. Uh, those impact us all. The air mats are for uh, the smaller aircraft, but the SIGMETs are significant. Significant meteorological event is really how you remember that. And we go on down the tabs. One thing I like to look at, you guys ever look at satellite information? Uh, several different kinds of satellite uh, products that we have available. We have visible satellite and we have infrared satellite difference between the two. The visible satellite imagery is only available during the daytime. The infrared is available 24 hours a day. These are from the GOES satellites. They're about 24,000 uh, miles up. GOES geostationary operational environmental satellites. We have the GOES 16 and 17. These are incredible satellites, brand new. These were just put in uh, a few years ago. GOES has been around for a long time, but the new ones with this incredible amount of resolution is just phenomenal. Look at that. We're watching that tropical system uh, down in the Gulf of Mexico. That's the visible satellite imagery. And you can think of a visible satellite image as almost having a camera in space and looking down and taking a picture. And we can look at all these different sectors. There's a look at uh, the Charlotte sector, and you can see some thunderstorms kind of blooming and blossoming around the Carolinas and Virginia. All right, so that is visible satellite. Let's go over here to infrared satellite. Infrared, as it implies, is taking a look at the clouds based on temperature. All right, quiz time for you. Think about this for a moment. What kind of clouds would produce the worst kind of weather? Would it be warm clouds or cold clouds? It's actually the cold clouds. Where you have those cold cloud tops means you have a very steep lapse rate. That means the temperature at the surface is much warmer than it is at the top. These are your convective type clouds. And on this particular color coding, we have those colored blue, okay? And there's all different kinds of color palettes for uh, this kind of satellite imagery. But on this particular image, we've got the cold cloud tops as blue. The red would be the warmer cloud tops. And the warmer clouds, fog sometimes even, uh, looks like a warmer cloud out there. Okay? Uh, just looking at different images there. There's Charlotte right there. Uh, we've got Wichita, Kansas. You can see some thunderstorms starting to develop right there across Oklahoma. These are different sectors of satellite images. 
Satellite imagery is very handy if you're trying to figure out where you have some thick clouds versus thin clouds. A lot of this information is close to real time, so it's going to come in handy. Remember, infrared, you can use it 24 hours a day. The visible satellite imagery is only available during the day. And I, one day I'm going to have my wife on here. Uh, and, and we're going to do this thing together because she cannot stand turbulence. Not a big fan at all. I mean, none of us really like it, but she really doesn't like it. She likes to fly in the morning or in the evening when we don't have a lot of thermals going on. Those bumps in the road that we get, that's all that rising air. Uh, any of you guys glider pilots out there, you know those thermals, that's the rising air. That's where we really get those bumps from. And also you get some bumps and turbulence induced by uh, terrain. The, uh, the air moving, the wind moving toward that mountain and then physically lifted up, you start getting some bumps there. But there's a lot of turbulence information. If you are uh, someone who's going to be flying, say, 1,000 to 13,000 feet, uh, you've got all of these different kinds of turbulence products here in forecasts that you can look at. And you can use this to help find a smoother ride. It's, it's, it's great information. I use it as a general rule though, if you want to have that smoother flight, uh, you are taking off and you are at your destination prior to say 11 a.m. and perhaps uh, during the late afternoon or evening, you are leaving after 4.30 or 5 and then you're landing sometime during the evening hours. So we're going to continue on here with uh, ForeFlight and some of the other data products that we do have and we do have the freezing levels. If we're going to be looking at icing and we're going to be looking out uh, into the uh, next six hours, you can tell what layer of the atmosphere, the lowest elevation where you would start to pick up ice. And somebody was asking me the other day, they're like, I'm a VFR pilot, I'm not going to be in the clouds when it's cold. Or uh, So is this really important to me? It is because you know what? You could pick up ice even as a VFR pilot. Imagine this. You have some higher base clouds. Uh, it's cold outside. Uh, you have a layer of warm air. It's cold down at the surface, freezing, for example, even at the airport. And you have freezing rain. So you could take off essentially and be in VFR conditions and still have that precipitation that is going to be hitting the aircraft surface, the, the wings, the fuselage, and icing up. So always a good idea to pay close attention to those freezing layers and levels and know what's going on because, yes, in, in most cases, icing is an issue for instrument-rated pilots flying in instrument conditions, but you can have icing that impacts VFR folks. And we always subscribe to what we call the clean wing, the clean aircraft concept, and that means no frost, nothing on the plane. It's clean when you take off. You know, imagine this. You have a, a larger airplane. You have frost all over it. That's going to impact things aerodynamically and also the, the weight of the aircraft. So a lot of information there. And I know with weather, a lot of times it is almost like information overload. It's drinking from a fire hose. We've got TAFs and we've got METARs. We mentioned the other day the MOS data. And you know, the MOS data is, is that model output statistics that you can look at on ForeFlight, which is a computer just spitting out information. I would much rather you base your forecast uh, on a TAF than MOS because a MOS uh, product takes the human element out of it. We'd rather have the meteorologist uh, really touching that information. But lots of different places you can go to get weather information. And then what I always really encourage folks to do, when you're doing your flight planning and you're looking at all this stuff on the ground, don't stop. In the air, constantly check what's going on. Have I picked up a little bit more of a headwind? Do I have more of a tailwind? How's that impacting my fuel consumption? If I've got a headwind, I tell people a headwind is like driving through mud. You're just spinning your tires. You're using a lot of energy, but you're not getting uh, covering as much ground. So that's very critical too. That can be a major factor in your flight planning and your fuel management. Don't let that uh, bite you. Also, what's going on, I'm, I'm flying out of an airport uh, coming up uh, very shortly this weekend. It's going to be an uh, elevation of close to 6,000 feet. 
How is that going to impact my airplane's performance? We always talk about density altitude. Sounds a little bit complicated, but what density altitude is, is really that airplane is going to, if the density altitude is four or 5,000 feet or 8,000 feet, the airplane's gonna be performing like it is at that altitude. You may be in Birmingham and your density altitude's 3,000 feet. It's gonna be like the Birmingham airport has been raised up to 3,000 feet. And if you're in a piston engine airplane, you got three strikes against you. The prop isn't biting as much air. The wings are not lifting as well because the air is not as dense. And also what you run into, the engine is not producing as much horsepower because the density of the air going into the intake there. So three strikes against you can really impact that aircraft performance. I hope you are enjoying these updates and these briefings and beyond the briefing. If you do, please like and subscribe. We're going to be churning these things out all the time. I love to talk about weather and how it relates to flying and hopefully we can uh, use this to help make you a safer pilot and uh, also help you even with your check rides. Until next time, I'm JP Dice.